Alright, so what I want to do is in honor of Veterans Day, I thought I would talk about one of the more interesting applications of mathematics. So this goes back to World War II. Uh, if you've watched the History Channel, you've basically almost surely seen something about World War II. Right? It was a, I'm sorry? And aliens. And aliens, <laughs> yes. And in fact, there's I think one episode where you actually find out, no, anyway. Um, so what I want to do is talk about one of the greatest achievements of the mathematicians and the statisticians in World War II. And again, there's a lot of different places where they contributed significantly to the Allied war effort. We will concentrate on the Allied war effort in this class. And this was in the German tank problem. So a very big issue was how many enemy tanks are you facing? Well, there's lots of different ways you could try to find out how many tanks there are. One way is you could ask the Germans, you know, how many have you produced, where are you <laughs> deploying them? Now, there are issues with the strategy. What's the big issue with the strategy? Response. You might not speak German. <laughs> you should have, hopefully, somebody who speaks German. <laughs> There's a better issue with that strategy. That's the thing is response bias. Oh, sorry, response bias? Yes, the, you know, if you ask the Germans, oh, you, you might get an over or underestimate of how many tanks there are in the theater. Now, the Allies had cracked the German enigma, so we could read a lot of their messages. So if certain things were transmitted, we could actually figure out exactly what was going on. The other thing is, if you had to use a word to describe the Germans, and boy is this dangerous, what word would you use? Organized. I'm sorry? Organized. organized, thank you. <laughs> I'm very glad that organized was the first word said. When the Germans made their tanks, they labeled their parts sequentially. So when the Allies captured tanks, they looked at part numbers. And they looked at which part numbers they observed, and they tried to figure out how many tanks were produced based on the observation. And this is extremely useful, because if you can get a sense of how many tanks are facing you in the field, you know how many of your own tanks to deploy against them. And so I thought I would warm up with a problem. So we observed K tanks with the following serial numbers. And I wrote a you know, simple Mathematica code. So you've observed 1142, 59, 1388, 1281, 15, 374, 165, 942, 1596, and 13. So the Germans, being extremely well organized, have labeled their tanks from 1 to N. And the question is, what is your best guess for how many tanks there are? How many tanks N are there uh, that have been made? 1500, 1600, 1700, 1800, 1900, or 2000 or more? Which number do you think is closest? And again, if you go over by one, that's better than undershooting by you know fifty. Which number is closest? Okay. The polls are open. Everyone wants to vote. Alright. Two more people need to vote. One more person needs to vote. Okay. Everybody has voted. Alright, and the results are, nobody went with A, 6% went with B, C was very popular today at 46%, I hope it won't be as popular when I'm grading, D comes in at 26%, E came in at 13%, F came in at 6%, and hopefully nothing else got votes yes. Okay, so can someone tell me why nobody voted for A? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? That number. Yes, that number, 1596. <laughs> if you've observed a tank at 1596, it's not going to be 1500 or less. The question then is how many more than 1596? Could you figure out the variance? I'm sorry? Could you figure you know, out the what? The variance of the ones you got. You, can, you, uh, you could figure out the variance and the mean of what you have. And so the question is, how do we use that information to figure out the answer? Uh, how, yes? Well, if they're randomly selected, shouldn't the mean be the same as the mean of all of the ones created? So one possibility is to say, let's take these numbers, let's calculate the mean, and then double it. So that's one estimate. The question is, is that the best estimator? So in terms of going into all the details as to what is the best estimator, uh, this is not my, well, okay, it is my department, we are the math stats department, but it is not my division of the math stats department. Okay? 
My division is on the probability side. And so I will leave... I'm sorry? Okay, so I will leave the argument as to which is the best estimator to the stats win. But we will talk a little bit about it, and then I've linked on the additional comments today a beautiful article by Wikipedia on the German tank problem. And that's actually how they refer to problems like this now, in terms of estimating the largest number, you know, the range, from the observed data. So taking the mean and doubling it is a good thing. There's actually something we can do that's a little bit better. And a lot of it comes down to in the limit, I believe they will have the same expected value for the number of tanks produced. I'm not positive, I think so. But you might be able to get something with a better variance. And so, the bigger your variance, the more uncertainty you have in your estimate. What was fascinating is when the Allies did this, using the mathematics I'm about to show you, they did far better at estimating how many German tanks there were than the intelligence you know, spies were getting. The Wikipedia articles are just phenomenal at how accurate they were. And this is, of course, very crucial to winning battles. I thought I would have a quote from one of my favorite movies, uh, Patton. How many of you have ever seen Patton? George C. Scott refused an Oscar for his role in Patton. It's a long story. I know people who served with General Patton. They said George C. Scott played a better Patton than Patton did. He just was able to maintain it well and longer. In World War I, uh, Montgomery, I'm sorry, uh, Rommel was a lieutenant in the German army. And after the war... He World War One. Oh. And after World War One, he wrote a book on German tank tactics, which Patton read before World War Two. And so when Patton's army met Rommel's army in the field, Patton had some inclination of what Rommel would do. Now again, usually you're not lucky enough to have people read your book. Not everybody can be a professor teaching math 341. <laughs> So, this is one of my uh, favorite examples of you know, information to help you. Right? Typically, you're not going to be that lucky. What if we said that to you right before the final? <laughs> if who said that to you? If we said that to you. Right? That you read my book? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> uh, I was just screaming it. You're looking at your binoculars. <laughs> <laughs> I love pulp. You know, if you can do it with the binoculars and everything, <laughs> but I mean, you really need the binoculars. From the, from the second level of I'm sorry, I'm at the third midterm. Oh, the third midterm. Yes, that's right, the third midterm. <laughs> Which we're just redefining as a final. <laughs> so the question is how would we get something like this? Okay. So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about the mathematics behind this, because the mathematics is a great way to review a lot of the things you're looking at this semester, and it has some fascinating implications. I mean, the German tank problem, this was very important to the Allies at the time. This is not just a busy work problem I'm giving you. So all this stuff I talk about, the tricks of how to look at these expressions, how to multiply by one, how to do all these things, here's at least a place where lives can be saved by multiplying by one. Okay? <laughs> Good lives. <laughs> Could you do something with N choose K? Yes. So, we'll get in just one second. So, N tanks, and it's unknown. Observe K values. N is the largest. Yes. Actually, before we get into the math, I have a bizarre okay. sort of question that you may be able to answer. Okay. So after this, did armies just did armies stop new numbering tanks? New well, a lot of it is when did people realize that people could do this to figure out how many were being produced? One thing is to encrypt your serial numbers. Now, the problem with encrypting your serial numbers is that it makes it a little bit harder on the mechanics. It's, no, it's very nice. If you have a bunch of tanks where the parts are labeled sequentially, and let's say you have a designation 001, means they were created in January, 002, February, 003, March. When you're trying to do maintenance, it makes it very easy to figure out when something needs to be done. So there are advantages to labeling. You have to then take this into account that, well, okay, well, there are advantages in terms of maintenance, there are disadvantages in terms of enemy trying to estimate how many tanks we have. Okay. Okay. No, good question. And so the Wikipedia article, Fountain of All Wisdom, does talk about you know trying to encrypt... Uh, tank numbers. So let's let x, it should really be x k 
kn is the random variable of largest observed tank number. So in the interest of chalk, I'm not going to keep writing kn. But you know, I've observed k tanks and n is unknown. So what is the probability that x takes on the value n? So Chris, you had started to say something with n choose k. Because you have k, which is the number of values. Right. And so, so there should be a division by n choose k. So you can have any m n but you have to remember to email me. Okay? What, what's the numerator? So I want to know the probability my largest tank has number m. So I've got to observe tank number m. And what can you tell me about the remaining k minus 1? Less than? So what would the numerator be? 1 choose 1. I observe tank m. And now what comes next? M minus 1, choose k. choose k minus 1. Okay. This is not the multiplying by 1 that saves lives. Okay, that comes later. Okay? But it's a good way to remember what we're doing. We chose the tank with M, and now we have M minus 1 tanks, and we have to choose K minus 1 of them. Alright. So what I want to do is I want to find what is the expected value of X. And so that's going to just be the sum. What's the range of M in my sum? I'm being a little lazy. I'm not telling you what's the probability my largest tank is numbered 5, given that I observed 12 tanks. Right? We know I'm not going to observe a tank of number 5 as the largest if I observe 12 tanks, because I have to observe at least tank 12. So really, the probability would be 0 if m is less than k. So this is really only for m from k to m. Okay. So I would get m times m minus 1 choose k minus 1 divided by n choose k. Right, so we need to figure out how to evaluate this. Any thoughts? We have a sum involving a binomial coefficient times something. What techniques do I love to use when I have sums? What's a good technique? that handled a lot of binomial sums. Differentiating, differentiating identities. The problem is to use differentiating identities, I would need a parameter to come down that I could differentiate with respect to, and I would need to have some kind of closed form expression. And I don't see how to get that here. So unfortunately, as much as I like differentiating identities, I don't think I can use that here. So I have to actually do something else. Does this look like anything to you? M times M minus 1 choose K minus 1. Yes. This is going... I, I'm just thinking I see factorials and I see an M further. Is there any way that we can throw a gamma function in? Or something like that? Or is it just out of the water? I, I, for, I, for, for this class, it's out of the water. It's a terrible thing to think of. You shouldn't even think of that. For an upper-level math class, it's an outstanding idea. This could lead to hypergeometric functions, and there may be a way to attack it. Okay. So, mixed answer. For this class, it's not going to be helpful to put into gamma functions. But for an advanced math class on special functions, where we knew things about hypergeometrics, that could be a way to go. Sorry. But what could we do? We've got all these factorials, and I'm multiplying <coughs> this by m. What does this kind of look like? I mean, yeah, in M minus 1, K, choose K minus 1, you're going to get an M minus 1 factorial term. And you could, so you could write it in that form and then get M factorial. Yeah, so maybe I should somehow play games like this. So M goes from K to N. Now, when I write this as M minus 1 factorial and I multiply it by M, I'm going to get M factorial. 